what do you, what is your what's your uh, what's your opinion on on um, uh, on his reasoning uh, of Mr. Brewster uh, on on deciding over whether or not to to um, to uh, collaborate with uh, with governments in this? Yeah, I, I would also say that this is not the easiest question to answer. But um, when you look at where we are, this information society. You see, you can look at it two ways. It is borderless, but it is also made up of individual countries, which have national laws, as I mentioned. They have cultures and values that are different. So while there are no borders in cyberspace, there are physical borders. And when you are going into a country, as I mentioned, I talked about the five broad reasons why there are censorships or filtering. These have to do with some of those national laws, some of those values which have been there. You know, um, we might need to look at some kind of a global cyber culture, but that does not exist yet because people are still rooted into where they were born. They are still rooted into the religions that the practice, they are rooted into some of the other cultural values that they have. And um, that is the challenge that we face because we have a global society with almost every country connected, but at the same time, we have these differences within countries. So I can sympathize with um, Google. Uh, I'm sure that when you go to another country, the reasons for censorship would be different from political. And that's exactly what I'm saying. You need to, global companies need to take into account the fact that the internet will not, from one day to the next, make those values disappear. The internet, I don't believe, will make governments disappear. It is not going to make religion disappear. So those values are important. And that is what makes the richness of the world, cultural, linguistic, religious, Socio uh, diversity. So we have to look at each individual country when you want to deal with them in business or set up something. You have to take into account those values. I think um, if you don't do that, you would just be trying to establish a service in another layer which really doesn't exist. So I do sympathize with the global companies. For ITU, we have all of these countries as our member states, 191 member states. So we have to, we are aware of the sensitivities. We are aware of the values which differ from one country to another. I do not want to give examples of why, you know, specific instances of censorship. I wanted to leave them out. I talked about five main reasons. And the one thing that I think we should all be aware of is that there is much more going on in the domain of censorship than what you hear about China. It is broader than that. You have to look at those five reasons I mentioned. And the question you have to ask yourself is, is one reason more valid than another to censor? That's a question that I have for you. Is there a reason which is more important, more valuable to censor content than another reason? I would just quickly add that for those who want to see the differences between these kinds of censorship, the maps that are published by the Open Net Initiative, you can just search that. Notice I did not say Google that. Um, the Open Net Initiative show the difference between political and cultural uh, uh, censorship in different regions of the world, and they're quite valuable to see which countries are doing what. Uh, they don't answer the whys, but they certainly lay out the groundwork. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Toko, can I just ask you shortly, um, following the example that, uh, that Bob gave on, uh, on the, the, the case in Italy about using privacy laws or 
uh, or, or perhaps even also like libel laws um, uh, in relation to content that's being published on people's website because this is, could be uh, is also a way of a more indirect way of censoring and also perhaps even also clamping down on on dissidents also in authoritarian countries. What do you, what kind of developments do you see in uh, in, in liability for uh, for content on uh, on websites? Um, do you see any developments in there? Um, <clears throat> that's again another not so easy question. I don't think there are any easy questions on this panel. Um, again, um, what we see this as something which is a reflection of the differences that we have, the differences in the national laws, the differences in how countries, what, con what countries consider as liability. Um, that's something which was also addressed during the World Summit on the Information Society. The whole idea was to try to see if countries can come together and have a common understanding on certain basic principles to build a global and inclusive information society. And um, what happened in Italy will most likely not happen in some other country. Um, Again, that is the challenge that we face, and I go back to what I mentioned. What are the liabilities for content providers in countries? We have to see, is there any common denominator? Is there any common element that countries, operators, providers can agree on as a basic rule so that when you are a global player and you have content in different countries, you have a basic idea what to expect in terms of your liabilities. That is something that we as ITU, we are working with our member states to try to come up with some kind of a common understanding. It is the reason why we chose protecting children online or the child online protection as one of the initiatives because we believe that everybody, every country would be sensible, sensitive to trying to protect children because you, are, you either have children or you have been a child yourself. So it is something we thought would be um, a unifying element. And when we take, for example, the liabilities, um, we believe that it is likely that all countries could agree that child pornography is a problem and if you are hosting that kind of content and you are aware that it is there, you could have some liabilities. So again, it is the complexity of the problem and trying to find this common element which everybody agrees to as something which is either uh, good or bad depending on their laws and cultures. All right, thank you. Um, we're moving to questions from the floor, also the uh, virtual floor, because I've just got to notice that uh, many, uh, many people are watching us uh, via GenevaSummit.org. Um, those people can actually also ask questions via uh, questions at GenevaSummit.org. Um, so uh, please don't hesitate and, and come up with your, your questions. Um, so we're not going to work with the, with the cards as, uh, as yesterday. I just want to see uh, who has questions uh, from the floor. Um, and we'll go there one by uh, one by one. All right, I'll start there. The the lady, the apple. Hi, thank you. My name is Martha Chertko, and I'm here with EUJS, and I'm also a student at Carleton University. And I just want to ask a question regarding the jurisdictional gap when internet is used as an incitement for violence or a medium for death. And I'm not quite sure if you're aware, but at Carleton University, one of my close friends, Nadia Kajuji, was a student there, and she was on the internet, and there was somebody speaking to her in a chat room who was posing as a young girl and ended up inciting her death and instructed her how to... She, she was in the chat room, and there was a man in Minnesota, oh, and uh, he posed as a young girl and told her how to commit suicide, instructed her, and over a period of a few months, she developed this relationship with this supposed young girl and ended up using his advice to commit suicide. And that case has been um, brought to the Minnesota jurisdiction, but they said, oh, it's not in our area. And they attached, they found his IP address, but they couldn't prosecute him. So obviously there's a jurisdictional gap 
that exist when internet is used as incitement for violence or for death. So I was wondering if you could suggest any proposals in that area. Thank you. I'm happy to say that I'm not a lawyer. Um, so it's very difficult for me to offer uh, anything like that. Um, this, is a, this is a major problem, uh, this kind of content on the internet. I've, I've worked for 20 years as an advocate for people with mental illness and also worked on these questions of uh, suicide, uh, people who aid suicide by publishing certain things. Uh, personally, I think the kind of stuff should come off just like I think plans for an atomic bomb should come off the internet. Uh, how exactly you make that happen, uh, I'm not going to answer, and I don't think any company could answer. Uh, I, I don't you know, even dare to uh, begin to understand the jurisdictional issues that would, uh, that that would be involved here. So I'm going to offer you that lame response and, and turn it over to my friend from the ITU who I assume knows a lot more about the law than I do. Uh, this is um, it's one of the challenges we face, as I mentioned. Um, we have 210 counties and territories connected, and we don't have this common understanding or protocol or treaty or agreement, something that will make, for example, the person sitting in one country far away, operating in a national jurisdiction, to be able to, to be prosecuted because they committed a crime via the internet. It is one of the challenges that um, we are facing, and I go back to um, the outcomes of the World Summit on the Information Society. Um, IT was uh, asked by world leaders during this summit to coordinate a global response. And one of the messages we are getting, not just from you, but from quite a number of uh, people, is how to come up with a common understanding on the legislation that should be in place, as we have for certain types of services for the air, as we have for some of the functions that IT undertakes, like um, managing the global spectrum and making sure that there's no interference. So we are working with our member states. We are looking at responses coming from them, requests. And this will ultimately be a decision of the member states I should also mention that um, we are working with a number of UN organizations who also have the mandate to bring together countries and try to agree on common laws which would be applicable for transnational crime or cybercrime. This is one of the biggest issues we face today. How do we bring countries, legislators together and agree on some basic principles on how you can treat a criminal case where the crime, the victim, and the, the weapon you use are in three different locations. So it is something which is part of the discussions we are having with our membership and with other UN organizations. All right, thank you. Um, I would like to move to the Mr. up there. Yes, if you can give your question brief and, and to the point, thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to congratulate Google for having sent their representative so eloquent and so convincing. And uh, I saw him yesterday as well. He's, he's pretty you speaking a little bit louder? <laughs> I was complimenting the uh, Mr. Rusing representative of Google. And I think he's a, he's a very eloquent and he presents his case extremely well. And I'm, I have become a fan of Google for two reasons. Once when they decided to get out of China, and I hope this is not a publicity stunt and it will go to the end and they really get out of China or China will give in. The second thing is that when they, when they uh, uh, showed how phony the 31st anniversary of Iranian revolution was when they, Google published the, the uh, satellite map of the area of the demonstration which was one third empty and the miles and miles of buses which had brought the people forcefully, by force, 
to the demonstrations. But I have one problem with this Google business in Italy. If the representative of Google could please give us the chronology of, of this. You told, me, you told us that it took two months for the Italian government to bring this matter to the attention of the Google. But first of all, why should the Italian government bring this matter to the attention of Google? And secondly, even if that is the case, why Google took so, 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 so long to take that offending uh, thing out of, the, out of the thing? That's one of my questions. My second question is that I am having, as a non-geek, I'm not a geek, and I said last night in a meeting, I type with the two fingers and it takes quite a long time to put, uh, type a page. Uh, and the providers cause me a lot of problem, including Google. Google, Microsoft, Firefox fight each other on my computer. And I'm the innocent party. And I'm not a geek to be able to, to, sol to solve that problem because they are, they are, uh, um, they are competing with each other on my yeah. computer. Can you please come to the point, the question? Yeah. Yes, I'm getting, I'm, I have to explain my points. They are, they are, they are important points, and I, I just can't put it in, in one, one phrase. Uh, my rights, my human rights, as a non-geek, is being, is being uh, undermined by the providers. And I have to explain why. Yet, the day before yesterday, I got, a, I got a, uh, something fishy uh, from Blue Wind. And I called Blue Win. I said, what, what is this you've sent me? You've sent me that if I don't get my Blue Win and get into, uh, into, uh, into Swisscom, you're going to cut my, 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 my uh, connection off. This is something odd. And I think this has not come from you. He said, yes, it is, it is a phishing thing. I said, what are you doing about it? Well, you know, we can't do anything. And by the way, the guy was extremely nice, extremely, uh, extremely helpful. But Blue Wind is not prepared to take any responsibility for me to giving my, my, my date of birth, my, my uh, codes, and my, 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 uh, my uh, name as an as, as, as a, as a, uh, internet user. And okay. if I was an innocent party, I would have typed okay. this thing and it would have gone and I would have been, been uh, t taken for a ride. So what I'm trying to say, Thanks. what about the right of the people who are beginners or who are not as good as you, uh, people, most of the people who are, uh, who are uh, very, very geek, and what about our right? All right, vis-a-vis -vis the providers. Thank you, yes, very shortly. Well, let me just talk about Italy first uh, and, and the way that the takedown system works on Google. Uh, as it, you know, we do not review everything that is uploaded to YouTube before it's uploaded. You can imagine that that's impossible. If we did that, then nobody would be able to upload anything. Or we would have to hire, uh, I don't know how many people, but it would certainly run into the hundreds of thousands to review the 20 hours that go up every minute. Uh, similar with Google Video, which is what this video was posted on, we did not review it before it went up. The Italian authorities, when they contacted us, and we were unaware of this until they contacted us. Sorry? Not as far as I know, no. I have not been, uh, there's no record that I have seen of such a thing. And we respond when it is flagged according to our system. And we have a fairly open system about how that, the, how that it works. I urge you to go onto YouTube and read the community guidelines and read how you flag a video in order to have it taken down. There are very specific guidelines that talk about hate speech, that talk about different categories in which we want traffic. Now, would I claim that we do this perfectly? Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, any such system is going to have its flaws. There's no question about it. But we do work as quickly as possible to, rea to react to those videos or those other things that are flagged and to take them down as soon as possible. I already responded to that. Um, in, in terms of what you're getting on your computer from different folks, I, I really can't uh, uh, take responsibility for that nor apologize for that. Uh, 
I, I think that everyone uh, who, uh, who owns a computer uh, has been phished or has received uh, badware, malware, spyware, uh, and is in some way uh, the, the recipient of spam. Uh, we have attempted to make sure that the system remains open, and that is that you have a choice in your search engine or whatever else you want to have uh, in terms of software that you want to use. Uh, there are other companies that are proprietary and that have closed systems, but our systems are not closed. And we think that's the right way for the internet to be. In terms of your specific complaints, I'm afraid I can't help you. Uh, and I don't think there's anybody who can help uh, all of the individuals who have specific complaints about what goes on on their computers, which includes me and every employee at Google. Thanks. I want to move on with a little bit of questions on, on freedom of the internet, and particularly focus on authoritarian countries, if you don't mind. This is one of the core, core topics of this, of this summit. So please, if you have questions on that, on that particular subject, all right? I see somewhere. Sir, yes, do you have some, such a question? Thanks. Uh, sorry, I, I could not hear the, your restriction, so can you repeat, because I am not sure that I am in, within your... Uh, well, preferably questions focusing on, on freedom of the internet in authoritarian countries where censorship is taking place, and the role uh, of governments, the role of, state, uh, the role of companies, and the role of governments. I am sorry, I think my question was in the, I mean, up to the point, but not to a specific country, so I don't know how I can... Well, I'm not, I'm not that strict, so please. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, my name is Boris Engelson, and I, I am a local journalist freelance. I don't want to make a new fan of you distinguished speakers, but I think that there are one of two, let's say, one should put things in perspective if one wants to address honestly and in a relevant way the issue of censorship and the Internet uh, freedom. First, uh, ITU is historically the organization which tried to thwart the advent of the Internet. I can understand that I am not going to blame personally Mr. Toko or his boss, but it is a fact that basically in, uh, ITU has been between the late 70s and the mid 90s, has been the organization trying to kill the internet before it developed, and it has been the history of a lost battle. And I have been attending virtually each and every meeting of the so-called WISIS, uh, that is the World Summit for the Information Society, and it is probably the most messy of all UN processes, and even its organizer complained that journalists do not show up, artists do not show up, intellectuals do not show up, librarians show up only in official function, and it is basically not only a mess, but a mass to the glory of ITU and UNESCO. So one should also take this into account, not censoring the true history of ITU and with this when addressing the issue of censorship. Whereas when it comes to Google, uh, of course this uh, attempt to reject the development of new technologies and free access and universal communication was not only the uh, uh, um, act of ITU, all vested interests have been trying to thwart the web when it started developing. Universities, libraries, everybody, uh, uh, journalists, publishers. So there was a huge vacuum and Google filled it, Google and Yahoo. But of course, each and every journalist know that censorship, when you have 40 million references for each word, each document you, you, you look for, is worse than censorship when you have no documents. There has been already a big shift in the 60s when organization, instead of refusing documents to journalists, would send them one ton of, of, uh, uh, of uh, documents. So the real issue, and I am not trying to make fun of anyone or, or uh, 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 attack uh, anyone, but precisely at WISIS, they try to make us think that the real government of the internet is uh, ICANN. But the government of I, uh, internet is not ICANN, it is Google, Yahoo and the like, and they do what they have to do, but to the user it is a, way, uh, a form of 
let's say, return of barbarianism, because precisely everything we had logical and, and, and uh, uh, let's say, sensible in libraries, in cataloging, in language teaching, has disappeared. Google is perfectly uh, a right to take avail of this situation, but still there is no way you can, uh, uh, let's say, access information when you just get 40 million references uh, most of them are plagiarizing okay, each other, etc. Yeah, okay, thanks. So Google is, is basically suffering on uh, the burden of its own success because it was the first question. And secondly, do you feel like the government of the internet, Mr. Google? I, I just think we have fundamentally different views of what constitutes access to information and, and censorship. I would rather have a hundred things to look at than nothing. Uh, and, and I mean, uh, I think throwing out the number 40 million is, is a little bit ridiculous, frankly. Uh, I, I, I wish that we had sometimes that many alternatives to offer. Uh, we have developed services in order to get over the fault that we're called sometimes too America-centric. Uh, such as Google News, which was developed so that people could see viewpoints from around the world rather than simply see a single viewpoint. Um, I, I will in no way uh, take responsibility for ICANN, and uh, anybody here who wants to take responsibility for ICANN, please be my guest. Um, I, I will say that uh, the internet governance structure internationally is something that I'm, I'm happily, I happily do not uh, specialize in. Uh, I think that it's, I think you're going a little too far though when you say that we have stepped into the breach and taken over uh, and, and govern everything that appears, which is really the implication of what you're saying. Uh, actually, I think the user still remains in control on the internet. Uh, we are fond of saying, and I don't think it's just a slogan, that you're one click away from leaving Google and going to wherever else you want to go. Uh, if you want to take all of your data and tell Google you don't want them to have it, that's fine. You can do that. Uh, if you want to take all of your data and migrate it, like a Gmail account, to another place, you can do that as well. Uh, I think one of the great things about the Internet is that nobody has a monopoly on the control of information. And I, I don't think Google or Yahoo or any other commercial entity can claim to have such. Mr. Doku, you want to, I guess, say something very briefly about the ITU and yeah. its allegations towards it? Yeah, what I, what I like about um, summits like this is really a demonstration of freedom of expression. And I think we have to really uh, uh, appreciate the fact that we are free to say what we want to say, whether it's correct or not, but that is part of what the freedom of expression is all about. Um, I think the speaker probably is not somebody who has been following up on how the internet started. It was a project in the U.S. Defense Department, and um, ITU has processes it follows for something to become an ITU product. And uh, 21 years almost in the ITU, I do not recall that ITU has ever been involved in trying to block the internet. I don't recall that. Um, and I think um, we also in a, in a summit like this, you know, we need to also try to, while expressing our freedom to speak, we need to also try to be less emotional and try to base them on facts and realities. Uh, I wouldn't get into some of the um, uh, the comments about the wishes. Uh, when you have nearly 90 heads of state and government, I don't know how this is really a failure. Uh, the first time that the four stakeholder groups, government, industry, civil society, and international organizations worked on an equal footing 
that's the first time for a UN summit to have all four groups. So we have a slightly different view from you about whether WISIS was a success or not. <laughs> but I'll just end my comments at that. Thank you very much. Um, I'll go up to the, to the back, the sir, up there, and go up there. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ntoko quite rightly insisted that differences in cultural and religious values will persist, but that it is possible to find some common ground on issues such as child pornography. And in fact, Mr. Borstein uh, identified as an area where he, uh, he certainly thought censorship would be appropriate on uh, whether or not posting plans for uh, bombs should be uh, on the internet. Could the speakers perhaps suggest a process by which the common ground might be widened without, of course, attempting to create anything like the unfortunate UNESCO New World Information Order from the 1980s? Uh, what would be particularly interesting would be ideas about how this kind of, shall we say, agreed areas of uh, abusive use of the internet uh, might be implemented and enforced. Thank you. Um, I actually think that while governments pursue this, there is a great advantage to be had by non-governmental entities also pursuing this. I mentioned earlier in my remarks the Global Network Initiative. Uh, I ask you all, if you have a moment, to look at it at www.globalnetworkinitiative.org. Uh, because it brings together companies, human rights groups, uh, Human Rights Watch, Human Rights First, Human Rights in China, folks like that. Uh, it brings together what we call socially responsible investors, uh, outfits like Calvert, uh, Domini, uh, FNC out of London, and it brings together academics, uh, particularly those out of the Berkman Center at Harvard and out of Berkeley, uh, into a single uh, group that has debated these kinds of questions, not particular bits of content per se, but questions on how you can reach agreement on putting together a process that allows you to look at the human rights implications of entering a new market or putting a new product into a market. Uh, I think that anybody who attempts to, and this is going to sound rather pessimistic, anybody who attempts to find a universal uh, declaration, a universal uh, uh, vision, common sharing of, of what in fact should not be allowed uh, on the internet is doomed to failure outside of a very small number of topics. Child pornography being one, I would think hate speech being another. Uh, how we get there, uh, I, I, I think again that it should be both a governmental process uh, and I, I favor both bilateral and multilateral talks, in addition to talks within the international institutions, uh, and the kind of process that brings together all the players who care about the internet. Uh, one of the things I can say for sure is that the reason that we joined uh, the Global Network Initiative and believe that it's the right way to go is because any company or any group acting on its own is a lot weaker than all of those groups acting together. And we already have experienced that uh, in the case of what was called the Green Dam software uh, in China last June. Uh, I can get into a longer discussion of that if you'd like. Okay. All right, thank you. Let's move on to a couple more questions. I think John here had a question. You can use the, the microphone. Thanks. I just want to ask a question. Oh. I just want to ask a question in reference to um, in repressive societies we've seen where literally, thanks to going mobile, as you were mentioned during your presentation, uh, dissidents have been able to literally, as being, the process being picked up by state security and about to be abducted, be able to actually tweet it, get it up on Twitter, and then use that to get the information to other folks. 
On the other side, we've also seen how the regime has responded by having their own folks on Twitter trying to uh, target those messages, as well as having good, savvy computer technology people to block those openings in, in the wall of, of information that the dissidents are able to pursue. My question for you is, does Google and some of these other companies in this open uh, uh, initiative that you've been mentioning, are you looking at having perhaps spaces where dissidents that are technologically savvy can uh, be looking at updates at what's working and not working around the world? Because I imagine that these different groups of uh, authoritarians are working rather effectively and coming up with new ways to block, and the dissidents are doing the same thing to counter. Well, we've certainly sponsored a number of conferences at which people have gotten together to talk about these things. Uh, we have engineers who are quite interested in this and work on it uh, in their spare time in addition to working on various tools uh, that the company's interested in. Uh, it's not something that I really, frankly, want to talk a lot about publicly uh, for obvious reasons, uh, but I'm happy uh, to talk to people uh, afterwards about specific interests that they may have uh, and specific tools that they would like to see uh, emphasized uh, or developed further. Thanks. Good. Sir, yes. Thank you for the opportunity. I think I've been trying to catch your eye for, for some time there. But uh, my question is dedicated to Google and ITU. And the question is about Africa. As we understand, information rights is a human right issue in Africa where, where people cannot access education. What initiatives is Google doing in Africa? Because today you mentioned that a very good uh, platform that is available, that's an option, is, is the mobile uh, platform. And discussions out there indicate that the mobile, mobile platform can be a good opportunity in Africa to increase access to education to a lot of children because the, the reality of one laptop per child is not achievable even in the next 50, 50 years in Kenya, because of, in Kenya, for instance, because of the infrastructure problems that we have. Another question that I want to ask is about, about information warfare. What, what, do you, what, what, what do you see the role of Google in information warfare? What is the role? Well, let's, let's, should we focus on the first question? I think it was a very good, very good question. Um, Alexander, you want to start? Yeah, um, we, ITU has been, of, of course, working with a number of uh, countries, but particularly the countries in Africa in a number of areas, um, assisting them in setting up their networks, setting up the independent regulatory authorities, uh, building capacity amongst policymakers so that they can put in place the necessary frameworks for the development of ICTs and easier access to the population. Um, we also recently held the Kigali Summit where you know, heads of states were invited and came and we talked about how to move Africa to the next step. But there are two elements which are important for development. You need to have the enabling environment in your country and it must be a kind of environment that will attract businesses. You see, um, I'm also speaking a little bit now as an African. Um, we can no longer continue to expect to develop Africa by waiting for handouts. It has to be business. And that is what the Secretary General mentioned in, uh, at the Kigali Summit in October 2007 or so, 2008. Africa needs to put in place the necessary environment which will attract businesses. When that happens, there will be development. Some countries have done it, and you have seen that there has been a takeoff in a development in both mobile and fixed and also internet. So that's basically what I'll say about uh, you know, the, what ITU is doing for Africa. It is a lot also to do with what Africa wants to do for itself. Let me just give you an idea of some of the projects that we've been working on in Africa. Uh, there are many. Uh, first, I'll say that our, our primary bases in Africa are South Africa and Kenya. Uh, those are the first places that we've really set down roots 
in Africa. We're, we're looking at several other countries and uh, we have a, a system where we send scouts into countries to see what the uh, environment is like before we establish a full-fledged office. Uh, we're the partial funders of a new undersea cable uh, that came in into East Africa, which you're probably aware of. We have invested uh, in a satellite network that at some point in the future, at several years off, uh, should provide for much better connectivity uh, in places that, where there are no landlines. Uh, and we're very high on that, if you'll excuse the pun, uh, very high on that uh, possibility, the potential for satellites to help people connect there. Uh, we've done a lot of work with mobile and particularly with local businesses so that they can find out the latest price of a commodity before they go to a certain place to sell that commodity. We think that the applications of mobile for practical, economic, everyday use are absolutely critical uh, in developing countries, and we've seen that across Africa. Uh, we've uh, done a partnership with the United Nations Environmental Program uh, to identify sites in Africa and elsewhere uh, that are on their list of the most important places to preserve. Uh, and when it comes to conflict, we are moving more and more into understanding how new media, and Google in particular, can be used to identify problems, to make the world more aware of them, and then how they can be used to ameliorate those problems. Uh, a good example of what we've done uh, is what we call our Darfur layer. Uh, if you go on Google Earth and you type in Darfur layer in the search box, you, you will find it. It's a joint project we did with the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. And it shows uh, quite graphically the villages that were burned down, villages that were half destroyed. It has links to videos of survivors of those villages. It has maps that show where the uh, displaced persons camps are on the border. Uh, it's the kind of thing that, that we feel uh, will really uh, help raise the visibility of conflicts such as Darfur, and that, of course, is a, is a first step, only a first step, mind you, but a, f a good first step in bringing that to the, to the, uh, to the eyes of the, of the Western world. Uh, we're also now contemplating uh, doing a similar uh, piece of work uh, in the Congo, where the conflict has claimed many, many lives, and it remains extraordinarily uh, invisible to the outside world. All right, thanks a lot, Bob. Um, we got to the end of this panel. I'm very sorry. It's, uh, it's 10.30. So uh, um, let, me, let me wrap up also just with a, with a personal um, um, something that comes from, from my heart also towards, towards, uh, towards Bob. Um, when indeed Google made this, made this step of, of uh, uh, declaring that it may pull out of China, I think I as a, as a regular Google user was, was, was even felt a certain sense of pride. And I think you should also, you guys should recognize that, that users, that the, the hundreds of millions of users uh, of Google do actually also want to feel proud of the, uh, of the company that they're using. So I think that kind of stuff and, and sticking to your principles will also help you ensure, uh, you ensure the confidence of your consumers. So stick to it and put it through and uh, let's hope it's not, uh, uh, let's hope it's, it's genuine, but I, I, I feel that it's, it's a genuine move from you. So thanks, uh, thanks Mr. Toko, thanks Mr. Burstyn. Uh, and thanks to you, and we're moving on to the next panel. I want to thank the panelists for addressing such important topics today and for Bart for chairing it. Uh, we're moving to our next panel and ask the panelists to come forward, please. The topic will be Young Rights Defenders and the Blogosphere, and we have the chair, Naomi Ishihara Rokum from the International Federation of Liberal Youth, Diego Sharifker, Ruslan Asadov, Dui Hong. If you'll all please come up to the podium. I also want to note that the dissidents and civil society representatives here at the Geneva Summit are working on a declaration on internet freedom, uh, which they, we will release 
at the conclusion of the summit this afternoon. So we're very much focused on this topic. Thank you.